There has never been a crazier time in Bitcoin's history than right now. Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, hard forks, soft forks, SegWit, SegWit 2X, mining, censorship, decentralization. We're going to try to cut through some of the confusion on the 72nd episode of Patterson in Pursuit. Hello, my friends, and welcome to another Bitcoin edition of Patterson in Pursuit. If you are a Bitcoin fan, then you're going to love this episode. If you're not, then go pick up a copy of my book, What's the Big Deal About Bitcoin? And learn why you should probably become a Bitcoin fan. There is so much confusion and uncertainty in the Bitcoin world right now. Some of that confusion comes from intentional misinformation. Some of it comes from accidental misinformation. If you're new to the Bitcoin space, be wary of the source of your information because there are a lot of channels of information online right now that are very heavily regulated and censored and sometimes downright propagandized. And if you've not been in the space long enough, you might not know how to recognize it. One excellent example of this type of censorship is the very popular subreddit r slash Bitcoin, which presents one very strict point of view and closely monitors and censors dissenting opinions. But you're going to hear more about that with my conversation with Mr. Ryan X. Charles, who is a longtime Bitcoiner, the CEO and co-founder of the company Yours. And interestingly enough, if I'm not mistaken, he stopped pursuing his PhD in a physics program because he was so enamored by Bitcoin and decided that he needed to work in the Bitcoin world. Before we start our conversation, I want to give a special shout out to all of the Patreon supporters who have been supporting my work online. Thank you guys so much for making this show possible. Not only are you helping me, but you're demonstrating to the rest of the world that there is a way to be an uncompromising, independent intellectual and still make a living. If you can find your group of supporters, create value for them, there's a new path available to, let's call them, entrepreneurial intellectuals. And if you're listening and you also want to help support the show, head over to patreon.com slash Steve Patterson. You can sign up to chip in just a couple of bucks whenever a podcast like this is released. And in addition, you get a free copy of all the books that I've written, including What's the Big Deal About Bitcoin, which is very relevant to this episode, and Square One, The Foundations of Knowledge, my most recent book about philosophy. All right, so I hope you guys enjoy and learn from my conversation with Mr. Ryan Charles. Mr. Ryan Charles, thanks so much for coming on to Patterson in Pursuit. It's great to have an old-time Bitcoiner on in what is probably one of the most exciting times in Bitcoin history so far. Yeah, thank you very much for having me on. I agree with you. It's extremely exciting right now. It's exciting and it's very confusing. And I've gotten, in the past week or two, I've gotten more messages from people who are like, Steve, what the heck is going on? Like, Steve, you know, I'm confused all the Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash stuff. So I know there are a lot of people that are trying to follow along, but they're very confused uh, and for good reason. So what I wanted to do while I've got you on the show is just lay out kind of the basic framework for what's happening in the Bitcoin space. We'll talk about Bitcoin and then the new Bitcoin Cash. So people have some context, maybe a little bit of the history. And I think if anybody yeah. ha has a confident prediction of they know exactly what's going to happen in the future, <laughs> I think they're confused. As evidenced just by every single day, if you follow the space closely, there's twists and turns that is just, it's, uh, it's exciting and it's a little overwhelming, I'm sure. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's very hard to keep track of. I mean, even being in this space full time, uh, so many things are going on that uh, even just within Bitcoin, it's very difficult to just stay on top of what's happening. Right. So let's start just at the, the beginning with some historical context for people that are familiar with Bitcoin, but they're not really into it. So Bitcoin's this beautiful online currency system that was developed about eight years ago now, something like that. And for many years, there's been questions about scaling. How do we scale the Bitcoin network to include more than just a few transactions per second? Because that's kind of the speed limit right now of the Bitcoin network. And correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a, the one part of the Bitcoin protocol called the block size has been known to be a cap on the transaction uh, speed of the network for many years. And it was up until fairly recently assumed that the block size was just going to be raised as the Bitcoin network grew. The block side was just going to be raised. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. I mean, that was that was certainly my assumption uh, for most of Bitcoin's history that that the cap would be removed 
uh, or at least increased and w that we would scale on chain. Okay. So wh what happened? Uh, what, what's yeah, the let me, timeline? let me just yeah. fill in. Yeah. Let me fill in a little bit of background information as I see it. And just for context, I, I got involved in Bitcoin in 2011. Bitcoin was launched in early 2009. I think it was something like January 3, 2009. And, you know, it was invented by Satoshi Nakamoto. Nobody knows who Satoshi is, whether it's a person or a team. P plenty of speculation out there about who that person or team is. Um, but, you know, so Satoshi wrote a bunch of stuff on the, the forum and the cryptography mailing list and some emails back and forth with a number of people, some of which are public. And one of the properties of Bitcoin is that it has this maximum block size. So blocks occur every 10 minutes. Blocks are what contain transactions. And it has a, a hard cap, uh, depending on how you look at it, because actually SegWit just activated within the past 24 hours uh -huh. uh, as we're talking right now. Um, but the base block size is still limited to one megabyte. So that means transactions as traditionally defined in Bitcoin are limited to a theoretical maximum of about seven transactions per second. Uh -huh. and seven transactions per second is pretty low compared to uh, systems like, like Visa. Uh, Bitcoin gets compared to Visa a lot, which, if I'm not mistaken, is somewhere in the neighborhood of more like 100,000 per second, at least at certain times. Mm. So the, the limit is, is really low by, by global standards. Um, but if you read the writings of Satoshi, and this is, this is part of the debate, is that not everyone takes Satoshi seriously. They're like, well, Satoshi left the community in late 2010 or early 2011, and so what does Satoshi matter anymore? But Satoshi, you know, nonetheless was a very... A uh, brilliant, you know, Bitcoin, uh, you know, engineer and scientist, of course, because he made the whole thing possible. And the idea was originally that, well, uh, Bitcoin will scale on chain. That is, you know, we'll just increase this limit. In fact, Bitcoin didn't even have the limit when it launched. Mm -hmm. The limit was added later on. I think it was, uh, I think it was 2010. I'm not exactly sure the timing of that, but it was added later on because when Bitcoin was extremely small. Uh, you know, Satoshi and others in the community were worried that someone could attack Bitcoin by broadcasting huge volumes of transactions. Um, so that was true then. We're in a different situation now. But the context here is that for those of us that either go back long enough or have went back and read the writings of Satoshi, the vision for Bitcoin was extremely clear. Mm -hmm. uh, the block size limit will be removed and Bitcoin will scale on chain. We'll be able to see not just seven transactions per second, but 70 or 700 and so on as the scale of the economy grows. I, I think I got in around the same time as you. I think it was around 2011, maybe. I, I think I might have heard of it maybe in 2010, but I was like everybody who was around back that time, I was like, eh, I don't think this is going to go anywhere. And then the price started accumulating. People started talking about it more. And, you know, here we are. But yeah. w what happened in that time frame? Because I, I think I remember at one point, there, I think this was last year in um, the beginning of 2016, there was what's called the Hong Kong Agreement, which is at the time, it was an agreement that there was going to be a, a block size increase in addition to this SegWit protocol. And we could talk about SegWit in a minute. But that what the community agreed at the time that, okay, this is, this is going to be the way forward for scaling. But that didn't happen. Why, why, yeah. is, why is it the case that there's been such inertia for raising this block size and continuing the scaling progress? Yeah. Well, let me provide even more context there because I think a little bit more history is also uh, uh, interesting. Okay. So, you know, the, the block size debate probably started, as best I can tell, approximately 2013. Uh, because you know, from 2011 to 2013, as best I can tell, it was the general assumption in the Bitcoin community that the block size limit would just be removed. Mm -hmm. And no one I talked with at that time uh, thought that it would be a good idea to keep a one megabyte block size limit. I mean, no matter how you run the numbers, it's extremely low by global standards. It, it just wouldn't scale uh, with such a small block size. Mm. Roughly 2013, you started to see a few people, um, you know, making comments about, well, it's important for decentralization that the block size limit stays in place. So that's roughly speaking the time when people started talking about keeping the limit in place. And let's see, another piece of context was by 2015, 
um, Bitcoin had grown enough that Gavin Andresen, who I don't remember if he was at the time still the lead developer, if he had passed it off to Vladimir, uh, but Gavin Andresen for some time was the lead developer of what's now called Bitcoin Core. Mm -hmm. And Gavin Andresen sent a mail to the mailing list, uh, the Bitcoin development mailing list saying, okay, guys, uh, you know, we've removed all the soft limits. It's clearly time to start figuring out how to increase the block size with a hard fork because otherwise we're going to hit that limit and it's going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. So that was early 2015 that actually kickstarted, um, mm. it, again, like, and this is my point of view, so take it for what it's worth and I don't know everything, but, you know, it seemed like some of the people that wanted to keep the limit in place kind of got into high gear or trying to figure out how to keep it in place. Mm. So that was when we started to see things like, you know, the many of the Bitcoin core developers really didn't like this idea at all about increasing the block size. Mm. So, uh, you know, Mike Kern actually created a, a different implementation of Bitcoin called Bitcoin XT. And Gavin Andresen thought, well, maybe we'll just implement a hard fork in Bitcoin XT and maybe mm. people will use that instead of Bitcoin core. Mm -hmm. And that was when we started to see things like the censorship in r slash Bitcoin and the Bitcoin talk forum. Because as soon as there was an implementation of Bitcoin that had a larger uh, block size or larger maximum block size, um, Thamos, the guy who controls all these forums, decided, well, this is a, uh, a, a an altcoin. This is not Bitcoin because you're changing the consensus rules mm. and just started deleting all of the discussion about Bitcoin XT from r slash Bitcoin and Bitcoin talk. Mm -hmm. And so there was a little movement in 2015 to create a Bitcoin XT uh, subreddit that was <laughs> moderated by Jameson Lop um, that was like, okay, well, we're kind of being censored from the main forums. Maybe we can find some other place to talk. So that sort of stuff ha started happening in 2015. The, the censorship and, you know, this sort of the vitriol started. It, it, it started mm. being a bit like, this is kind of weird. Why are people so opposed to raising the block size. Right. So in 2016, the debate had already been, it, it had gotten, you know, pretty serious at that point. In fact, in late 2015, there was uh, the first scaling Bitcoin conference that was put together, you know, sponsored by Blockstream and a number of others. Uh, and they discussed, the, the and I was there in Montreal, uh, the, the first scaling Bitcoin conference was about finding every way to scale Bitcoin that isn't raising the maximum <laughs> block size. Um, and I shouldn't, maybe, maybe it's not quite that extreme. I do remember, uh, Peter Risen was there and he gave a presentation and I sort of pushed to raise the block size when I was there. Mm -hmm. Um, but most of the talks were more about the lightning network and about other things, uh, about other ways to scale Bitcoin. So, uh, then fast forward to early 2016, and then we have the, the Hong Kong agreement. So there was another scaling Bitcoin conference in Hong Kong, and I don't remember the timing of this or what meetings occurred or whatever, but somehow the miners, and I was not at that conference, but the miners ended up, um, the miners and the core developers basically had a meeting and decided, okay, look, here's what we're, we're going to do. The, the core developers announced SegWit. Uh, SegWit was a way to soft work in a, a, uh, a roughly speaking two times capacity increase in the block size by changing the way that the, the transactions are structured and it's called SegWit because SegWit stands for segregated witness, uh, and the the witness, the signature, is segregated. So uh, the, it changes the, the structure of a transaction in a block, uh, and it's able to soft work in a, a larger capacity increase. So, But the miners wanted a hard fork. They're like, we just want to increase the chain uh, so that more people can use it. So they pushed for a hard fork. So the agreement ended up being, well, what we're going to do is it's going to be SegWit plus a two times hard fork increase. Mm. So that was called the Hong Kong agreement mm -hmm. uh, in early 2016. Uh, fast forward a little bit more. Um, so that was the agreement. This was the assumption that the core developers were going to implement SegWit and a two times uh, hard fork, a two times increase in the base block size. But, but the vitriol and the debate continued and basically Bitcoin Core ultimately decided we're just not going to do a hard fork at all. We're just moving forward with SegWit. We want to do SegWit first and indefinitely delay any hard fork. Mm. So I'll just leave it at that. So that's 2016. Um, 
more stuff happened now, but I'll let you, uh, you know, comment or ask questions if you have more, more to say about that. Okay, so yes, let's, let's address then the concept of decentralization in relation to the block size. Because if, if people are not following this, and I, I, this thought has crossed my mind many times, but what in the world is the hesitation for raising the block size even to two megabytes when it is right now at one megabyte, which is a tiny increase, what what is the best version of their argument for why we should avoid the block size increase? Sure. I mean, I'll, I'll do as best I can. I mean, I'm not really the best person to pitch their argument because I don't agree with them. But mm -hmm. So take take everything I say, of course, with that in mind. Um, but the argument is basically, look, um, if you increase the maximum block size, that means the blockchain is going to grow faster. And that means it's going to be more expensive to run a full node. And so that's going to mean that fewer people are going to run full nodes. Mm. And so that m makes Bitcoin more centralized. That's their argument. Mm. Um, of course, I would, I would disagree with that, but I'll just leave that for a moment. Uh, there's, you know, that's that's a, the high-level view of their argument about why it's bad to increase the block size. Okay. So when you say full node, is that not a legitimate concern? Because it's at least in the way that they phrase how the Bitcoin network works, they claim that the nodes, not with the, there's a distinction between miners and nodes, and they claim that nodes really are the ones that are securing the network, arguably even more so than miners. Because if you have miners that are nefarious, the, the nodes might protect us for some period of time. So maybe they could hard fork to a new, um, like a new hashing algorithm or something. It's supposed to be that nodes have this key function when they're not mining. Is that a correct way to understand how the Bitcoin network works? Uh, I, I mean, in short, I don't think so. Uh, you know, it is. I'll, I'll start by saying that I think it's a valid concern. I mean, mm -hmm. it is true that if the maximum block size is raised um, and then assuming, of course, Bitcoin actually gets higher transactions, you know, higher transaction volume when the maximum block size limit is raised. Um, then it is true that running a full node will become more expensive. It will be it will consume more disk space and more bandwidth and more of your computational resources. Um, so that's true. It, it makes it more expensive uh, to run a full node. Um, I'm not sure that uh, that I believe that full nodes are anywhere near as important as they seem to think. I think the miners are incredibly important. I think the miners are what actually secure the network. Uh, the miners are why it's difficult to reverse transactions. It's all but impossible to reverse a transaction that's confirmed on Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, miners have a much, much larger role to play than than full node operators. Okay. So the way the way I think about this is more in terms of why are you doing what you're doing and what are your incentives? So mm -hmm. the miners are mining Bitcoin because they earn money for mining. Full node operators, well, look, I mean, you're processing, you know, you're validating all transactions on the network if you're running a full node. So who would want to validate all transactions? Well, miners want to because they want to be sure that when they mine a block, they're mining valid transactions because if they mine an invalid block, then that block will be rejected and so they lose money. Mm. So they want to be sure that they're mining the real blockchain, so to speak. So they're going to run a full node. Another category of sort of user that would run a full node are large businesses that process a lot of money. Mm -hmm. If they receive large payments, they want to be absolutely sure that those payments are valid. So you can imagine a business, well, like BitPay, that receives you know a huge volume, and I don't know what the numbers are, but they receive quite a lot of money in Bitcoin every single day from you know people purchasing things with Bitcoin mm -hmm. or paying invoices or whatever it is. They want to be absolutely sure that those transactions are valid. So they're going to run a full node. But mm -hmm. BitPay is a business. So the fact that a full node is extremely inexpensive to run uh, is not really a factor for them. Mm -hmm. um, the bigger factor for BitPay is transaction fees. Mm -hmm. uh, transaction fees are vastly higher for BitPay than it is the, the cost of running a full node. Casual users, people that send and receive small amounts of money, almost certainly just don't need to run a full node. Mm. And, it, you know, a concern here is that people will say things like, but I, I'll have to trust people if I want to run a, if I don't run a full node. But you don't really have to trust people very much. The trust is extremely low. You can validate your transactions very, very well. You can validate the individual transactions you receive. You can query transactions that they come from, make sure those transactions are valid. 
you can look at the proof of work on the blockchain and see which one's the longest chain without necessarily validating all the history of transactions. Mm. Casual users probably do not need to run a full node. It, mm. It's just not necessary uh, to validate you know, all of Bitcoin's transactions if you're not receiving huge amounts of money. So, yeah. so your right. conception then of how the Bitcoin system could operate is one that's the infrastructure is provided by business rather than just individual users all over the world who are trying to maintain the network and run full nodes. Is that right? Absolutely. And uh, we can we can ex dive into that because that that thought terrifies a lot of people. But that's definitely how I see this playing out over time. So do you how then do you respond to the claim that that is a centralization worry that, oh, well, if it's businesses that are providing this service, what happens if they become corrupt or what happens if they want to change the code or if governments get involved? If you, if the if the centralization is not down to the level of the individual users, but of businesses, isn't that a bigger target for like catastrophic failure of the network? I don't think so for the same reason that I don't think that it's a problem in the market as a whole. Um, the way I think about this is the market, and when I say the market, I'm talking about, you could look at really any in individual market or the world global market. The market is decentralized, not because everyone does the same thing, but because everyone does different things. Mm. Specialization is okay and it's a good thing. The market is extremely decentralized and robust because people specialize. This is what allows the market to achieve such high levels of growth. This is what allows people to win at their specialty, to earn money and fund themselves for what they're doing. They don't have to do everything. They can do their part and they can earn money from doing so. Mm. So I don't see that as being a threat at all. I see it as being the greatest ally to Bitcoin. The market is how Bitcoin is going to achieve global adoption. Allowing businesses to win is how Bitcoin will achieve global adoption. This is how the value increases. This is how the utility of it increases. It's not bad at all. And I'll just remind anybody who's listening to this. Uh, I mean, of course, you can just run your own business. I mean, what, you know, it's, it's not like Google is going to run all of the businesses of the world. I mean, run your own business and do what's in your own interest. If it's in your interest to run a full node, then you're running a full node. Mm -hmm. But you're only going to do that if you're earning enough money from your business that it makes sense to do so. But good. I mean, that's how it should be. Would you say that it's fair to claim that the likely original vision of the people that got involved in the space and maybe of the, the creator of the network is that the actors in the network are going to be responding to their economic incentives? So it was not it wasn't part of the original vision to have the network supported by nodes that don't actually have a financial interest in being nodes. It was created so that those with the economic incentive would then have the reason to secure the network explicitly. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's 100% correct. That's exactly how Bitcoin is designed. That's the economics of Bitcoin. The economics of Bitcoin are Bitcoin very, very thoughtfully incentivize the, every actor in the space to do what's in their own interests for the survival of the network as a whole. Mm -hmm. The miners are incentivized to do what's in their interest, the, uh, the businesses, the users, and so on. Um, if you just act in your own self-interest and use Bitcoin as money, everyone wins. It makes the Bitcoin economy grow. Uh, it is the best thing for Bitcoin as a whole that people simply act in their own best interests. Mm. Now, I'm going to make a, a claim here. I don't want to put words in your mouth. but from So here's my perspective of this kind of conceptually, that it seems like what the, the small block, block proponents have done is find a feature of the Bitcoin network that is unimportant, or relatively unimportant, which is the full node count, and claim that that feature of the network is now some critical and important part of the network and that if it's that they found a flaw in the bitcoin network because it would be a catastrophic flaw in how the network is supposed to operate if the um if the nodes perform an essential function and they're not economically rewarded with it so it's it's like they've found a genuine flaw if it's the case that the uh, the nodes are as important as they claim they are but from my perspective I don't think the nodes are as important as they claim they are. So they've, they've kind of created a problem and then tried to solve the problem that they've created, which might not actually be a problem in the first place. 
Yeah, that's an interesting, uh, interesting way of looking at it. I mean, I think, you know, I think that's true. I mean, I think that they have a philosophy, they being, and I, I'll be careful how I say this because I, at no point am I trying to offend any of these people. I'm not right. trying to say anything bad about them. Right. Most people in that camp are, uh, are good people. I know many of the people, we just disagree about this issue and that's fine. Mm. Um, but it does seem to be the case that they have latched on to, uh, uh, you know, sort of the wrong metrics here, you know, like node count and block size are, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the way we win this is that, you know, people use Bitcoin as smart money, right? That you can, it's, it's sound digital money. It's peer to peer money. You can send and receive it to anyone in the world. It's permissionless. The sound part of it is so important. I mean, Satoshi absolutely nailed uh, the money property of Bitcoin. It leads up to a finite ultimate amount. That's that's a that's like the master stroke of Bitcoin. Mm. Uh, it means that all the incentives align to make Bitcoin the money of the future. Um, I think that I think that you're right that these people are looking at the wrong metrics. That node count is not the most important metric. Um, okay. I think yeah. Well, so so it, it, what about then mining centralization? So let's say it's the case that well maybe no. Uh, nodes that aren't mining, maybe they're not as important as they've been made out to be. But what about the concern of the centralization of mining? Because if it's the case you have bigger block sizes, let's say they're very large block sizes to try to accommodate a large amount of transactions, the the ability to, to mine then does become more centralized because it's more expensive for the reasons that you pointed out. Couldn't that then be a legitimate centralization concern? Well, okay, so there are a couple issues here. First of all, the way I look at this is mining centralization is 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 a problem if it happens. So if it is the case that a single miner has greater than 50% of the network, that's definitely a problem. Hmm. Um, however, I think this is completely unrelated to the maximum block size. Hmm. Uh, the, the reason why it's hard to mine is because you have to have specialized uh, computing hardware that's expensive to develop and to and to to acquire and you have to have a huge amount of electricity to do the mining mining is what's expensive not running a full node i mean running a full node you can do it on a on a desktop computer in fact i think i'm not sure if this is still true but it was the case that you could run it on a raspberry pi mm -hmm. um, as the block size increases that will get more expensive um, but it's it's vastly lower than the cost of mining mining is is what's expensive to miners not running a full node Mm. Now, doesn't that mean, though, that as those costs increase, there's going to be fewer and fewer people that can afford to undertake the process of mining, that it's only going to be these, these mega companies like Amazon that can afford the kind of bandwidth and electricity costs, costs to mine? I don't think that's correct, because in order to mine, what you have to have is you just have to have margins. You have to be able to earn enough money from mining that you're more than covering your expenses. So it's not like there is a single giant upfront expense. It's more like it's just a business and you have to operate your business efficiently like you would with any other business. There are some upfront capital expenses. Um, I don't know how that will play out over time, uh, but the upfront capital expenses, I mean, you can buy mining hardware. Uh, I'm not sure how expensive it is. I'm not a miner myself, but it's not like you have to have a million dollars to buy mining hardware. You can be a very, very small miner uh, with a, you know, a, a small amount of money. The, the, the tricky part is you just have to be sufficiently efficient with your business operations that you earn more than you spend on it. Hmm. So I don't think that's true. I, I don't think that the uh, rising costs necessarily exclude new players because the gains also rise. You hmm. can earn right. money from it. And if you just earn more money than you're spending, uh, it doesn't matter how big you are. Right. That's a good point. So I want to ask one more question. Um, technical question and then we'll get into some just the recent events this is the, the important preface that i think a lot of people miss is the kind of history and backstory but the current events are are even crazier but the technical question has to do with simple payment verification or spv as some people will claim that one of the ways that you can um that you can scale on chain is by using an SPV uh, system. And then there's a lot of small block proponents that say, no, SPV won't actually scale. Um, this is this is confused. Can you give a little, just a brief overview of what SPV is and what your perspective is on whether or not it can actually scale? 
Sure. So SPV is something that was described in the original Bitcoin white paper um, by Satoshi Nakamoto. It, it is it was literally in the white paper and the white paper was released before Bitcoin, uh, you know, uh, launched, you know, on, in, in code and in practice. Um, SPV is just it's a way of using this this fancy Merkle tree structure in a block that lets you find and assure that your transactions are in a block without necessarily having the entire block. So if you you can see the proof of work, you can identify which chain is the longest chain by looking at the proof of work. And you can then query uh, anybody who has this data to see if your transaction is in there. And the amount of data you need to do this is extremely small. Like it's basically the size of your transaction plus you know another data structure that roughly speaking is also the size of your transaction. It's a very small amount of data. Uh, it's you know it's it's trivial. You could do something like this on a uh, a uh, you know a feature phone. I mean, it's not a lot of data. So the idea is that you can send and receive money this way without running a full node, and you can still know with confidence that your transactions have been confirmed uh, without validating every transaction on the blockchain. Now that sounds uh, that sounds great. But what it, what's the objection then? Why would people say that that can't scale? Well, there are a number of objections. So uh, I'll start with well, I'll start with the most serious objection, which is the way that SPV clients are currently implemented rely on something called Bloom filters to query other nodes for your uh, transactions. And Bloom filters let you basically the idea is that you you don't want the other nodes to know which transactions are actually yours. So you set up a filter that sort of randomly selects um, other transactions, including yours, mm -hmm. and you query those. And the way this Bloom filter uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, system is implemented in, in current full node implementations, it's pretty inefficient. When you add a new Bloom filter, in order to actually know every single transaction, you have to scan the entire blockchain uh, you know, to to do that, which is extremely, you know, it's like just incredibly inefficient. Okay. So that's the objection. Now that objection, however, is just because of the way that the things are currently implemented. It's true that if it's implemented that way forever, uh, that, you know, doesn't scale very well. It's a very poor property. It's a huge burden on full nodes to service the SPV nodes. But there are vastly simpler ways to do this that don't require uh, bloom filters. So it sort of depends on exactly what properties you're looking for in a wallet, how private mm -hmm. you want it to be, and so on. Mm -hmm. Jameson Lopp wrote an article recently sketching out just how expensive it was to uh, to you know to run a full node that services SPV nodes using this uh, you know this this algorithm. Um, but I responded to him and sketched out an alternative solution. Uh, so if, if any of your you know listeners who are curious about that could go read Jameson's Lop, uh, Jameson Lopp's article and my response to it. There's a very simple way to completely solve all of the problems, which mm. is when you are paying someone, you just give them your transaction directly. So mm. instead of having them query the blockchain to try and find your transaction, you just give it to them. I mean, if you're going to pay somebody, um, it ought to be pretty straightforward to just hand your transaction to them. I mean, whether it's a merchant on the Internet or it's in person or whatever it is, you probably know the person that you're paying and you can communicate with them and hand them the transaction directly. And if you do that, they don't need to use any of this fancy bloom filter stuff. Um, they can just query uh, for that transaction directly. Mm. So, you know, problem solved. Again, like there are privacy concerns here. Um, so, you know, it, it, you, you'd have to sketch out, you know, exactly what your privacy concerns are. But there are ways to solve all these problems. Like mm. it, it is a software problem, not a protocol problem. In my opinion, SPV absolutely can and will scale to billions of users. Mm, billions. Okay. So that's a perfect segue because I think given the nature of the censorship on uh, online, which a lot of like new users are maybe unaware of, the, the voice the voices about on-chain sca uh, scaling have been uh, silenced. <clears throat> so people genuinely think, that the way that they're approaching the problems in Bitcoin is by looking at node count, by thinking that SPV actually can't scale, and they don't hear any other voices which are trying to say, hey, actually, we can probably solve these problems. So the so there we've got these two camps. They've got they've become impassioned and emboldened, and then 
I think the next historical step to set up the the immediate events that are going on is the UASF. So what what was that all about? And then what did it lead to in the beginning of uh, August this month? Sure. So UASF was a movement that was initiated by someone named Shaolin Fry. Shaolin Fry is an anonymous figure in the Bitcoin space who just had an idea who is like, okay, uh, the miners want to uh, increase the block size. Well, we want SegWit. So he put together an idea. I don't know if it's a he or a she, but they put together an idea for UASF. It stands for User Activated Soft Fork. And the idea was that on August 1st, they're just going to fork Bitcoin to start activating SegWit with no uh, uh, corresponding hard fork to increase the block size. Mm. And what they're going to do is they're going to start uh, – ignoring uh, blocks generated by miners that don't support SegWit. So the idea was that the users could force the hand of the miners into accepting uh, you know, segregated witness. Mm. Um, that was the idea of UASF. Now what happened there is, you know, so, so part of this you know, whole situation is confusion around who actually has what power here. Is that even possible <laughs> for ahead. the – full nodes to like force the hand of the miners like you know so they just start ignoring the blocks from the miners but so what i mean it matters like what are the businesses running i mean like right. you know who's actually running these nodes because if you're just running a node by yourself and you just start ignoring blocks from the miners well that has no impact whatsoever because <laughs> you're just going to you know delete the miners nodes but the economy goes on mm -hmm. so it would only matter if uasf happened like if a business supported uasf because they could fork off their business onto a different chain. Mm. Um, so part of it is just like it was unclear exactly. And although I think the miners have a lot more power in this situation, it genuinely wasn't clear like what actually could happen here. I mean, what will happen with UASF? Will that actually cause a fork? I mean, I'm, you know, I wasn't really sure. Um, but so that started, I think it was in February. And so there is a movement for UASF. And all of a sudden you see like a bunch of people, you know, changing their Twitter handles to include UASF in it and declaring <laughs> their support for UASF mm -hmm. and attacking the miners, which is a whole other story. But there is a lot of vitriol against the miners, accusing Jihan of, you know, being, you know, the, the central leader of Bitcoin and things like that. Um, and, you know, the, this, this sort of UASF movement being very extremely in favor of just forking off from the mm -hmm. miners with, with their own chain. Mm -hmm. Um, so what then happened in response to that was, uh, uh, Bitmain, which is so, so Jihan is the you know the CEO of Bitmain. They're uh, the largest miner based in China, and they're like, okay, well you you guys are going to fork off. I mean, this is potentially a disaster for the network. What we're going to do is we're going to create UAHF, which is mm -hmm. user activated hard fork. And the original idea of UAHF was if UASF actually happens, then what they're going to do is they're going to hard fork off without SegWit to a larger block size, and that that would also occur on August 1st, but slightly later uh, than UASF to make sure UASF actually happened before the hard fork happened. Mm -hmm. So so originally, UAHF was like a backup plan in case UASF happened. Right. And I'll leave it at that. There's, of course, more to the story, but maybe you have comments or questions about that before I finish the story. Uh, no, you keep going. So you know what then happened is there's another miner. Uh, called Via BTC, also based in China, and Bitmain is a minor investor in minor minor as in you know less than fifty percent investor in, but they do have financial ties uh, in Via BTC. Via BTC decided, you know what, we're we're sick of dealing with core and the small block people. We're just going to fork off anyway. We're just going to do UAHF on August first, no matter what happens with UASF. Mm. So they they named their uh, initiative Bitcoin Cash, and they use the same code base that Bitmain was going to use for UAHF, uh, which is called Bitcoin ABC. Bitcoin ABC is a new implementation of Bitcoin. That's a fork of Bitcoin Core uh, created by Dedelnix and FreeTrader, the two uh, primary developers on that on that uh, software. Hmm. And they actually did, a, and, and also a number of other developers from other implementations like Bitcoin Unlimited, Bitcoin Classic, and uh, Bitcoin XT all collaborated on the spec for this, and they all ended up adding support for this. So there are actually at least four different implementations of this. Hmm. Uh, but anyway, via BTC decided to just do it anyway. So that was in like the middle of July. Via BTC announces, okay, we're <laughs> doing Bitcoin Cash. 
that is UAHF. We're just going to go ahead and do it whether UASF happens or not. So they announced that, and then two weeks later it happened. And now all of a sudden we have a new version of Bitcoin called Bitcoin Cash hmm. that has more than $10 billion in value. <laughs> and I'll go check right now, but it seems to vary between being the third largest and the fourth largest cryptocurrency in the world. And at this rate, it's only like three weeks old. Right. So at the present time, it has a market cap of $10.6 billion. And I mean, today is August 24th. Uh, it only, you know was created on August 1st. <laughs> so here it is 24 days later, and it's a, it's a $10 billion system. I mean, it's absolutely shocking. <laughs> right. And other stuff happened. It's so ridiculous how fast this is happening. It's unbelievable. I mean, even being involved full time, it's, it's very difficult to keep track of everything. But we've seen some really, really major impacts from the existence of Bitcoin Cash. Mm -hmm. So we've seen the mining profitability. So originally, a Bitcoin Cash launched, it was not more profitable to mine. It was less profitable. So via BTC mined it for themselves for a while. But they added a very key change to the protocol along with the hard fork, aside from just increasing the block size. Mm -hmm. They added this emergency difficult adjustment algorithm that if blocks aren't found fast enough, the difficulty adjusts downward more rapidly. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is it becomes profitable uh, quickly if there's if there's less mining power. So what happened is the mining power was very small. Eventually, it, it, it did the emergency downward adjustment a few times. It achieved a sort of stability point where it was not profitable, but via BTC kept pushing it and kept mining it anyway. And then somebody in South Korea bought a huge amount of Bitcoin cash, sending it from $200 to $800. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it became profitable Mm -hmm. And that was right before another downward difficulty adjustment. So it became profitable. Then the di difficulty adjustment adjusted downward one more time, decreasing it, the difficulty by 41% and rapidly raising the profitability of Bitcoin cash versus Bitcoin. Right. So all of a sudden it was something like 150% more profitable to mine Bitcoin <laughs> cash. So a huge fraction of Bitcoin miners, something like 30 or 40%, all switched over to Bitcoin Cash for about two and a half days and mined Bitcoin Cash. And this sent Bitcoin fees up significantly uh, because the, a large fraction of miners left for a different coin. This then, and then all this happened in a very short period of time. So the difficulty adjustment occurred on uh, Saturday. And so many miners switched that, look, normally the Bitcoin, the, the difficulty adjustments are supposed to take two weeks. So many miners switched to Bitcoin Cash, raising the, the hash power so much that the next difficulty adjustment occurred just two and a half days later. That's crazy. And so then it became very hard again. Then uh, for a couple days there, uh, the blocks were coming in very slowly. And then all of a sudden, then the price was somewhat stable. The price is currently about $643 uh, for Bitcoin Cash. Uh, so then what happened is the difficulty adjusted downward, then the miners did it again. Miners switched over again. And so <laughs> we're currently in a period of very high block generation on Bitcoin cash because mm. so many people have switched over again. So it's just crazy. I mean, you know, so, so Bitcoin cash has had a giant impact on the space because it's created a huge amount of new value. Uh, depending on how you look at it, you could say maybe it's taken value from Bitcoin. It's unclear how to look at that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also shifted the mining power. So we're in, we're in an unstable state right now mm -hmm. where it's unclear what's going to happen. I mean, you know, are we going to reach an equilibrium where Bitcoin Cash stays at its current value and then a certain number of miners just pick one or the other and it stays there? Or if the price changes significantly on one or the other, it really changes the 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 difficulty equation and the profitability equation for the miners so mm -hmm. they can they can switch and they can switch in an instant. I mean, they can switch just as soon as one is more profitable than the other, they instantly switch. Mm -hmm. So it's very unstable. Now, doesn't that seem like that that's a problem that needs to be resolved? Because if you've got the, this huge difference in the time it takes to generate blocks, doesn't that mean it's going to also affect how long it takes to confirm transactions? Because that's not a, a good circumstance. No, it's not. It's it's a very weird circumstance. So the length of time it takes to confirm a transaction on Bitcoin Cash can change quite a lot. It can take something like two hours if you're in one of these, you know, the miners have left situations, or it can take one minute if the <laughs> miners have piled in 
and have started mining Bitcoin Cash. So I wouldn't say that's a good thing at all, but it's also just not surprising. Like, I'm not really sure it's bad either. Mm. What it is is just a sign that this is a very dynamic and unstable situation. Now, if that weren't crazy enough, there's another piece of the puzzle here, which we, we didn't even mention, which is the SegWit 2x proposal that the Bitcoin community, a large part of the Bitcoin community, agreed to earlier this year. So I'll, I'll try to, to summarize it, and then if I make a mistake, please correct me. So I don't exactly know when the, um, the, this agreement was, but there was another agreement like the Hong Kong agreement at the beginning of 2016. It's called the New York Agreement. The New York Agreement is essentially a new version of the Hong Kong Agreement. It says, okay, we're going to uh, implement SegWit, and we're going to also have a, a two times hard fork increase after the implementation of SegWit. That was agreed to, but I think at the time it was like 95% of the hash power of the entire Bitcoin network. And this was before the Bitcoin Cash split. So now uh, we're in a period as of today or yesterday where the SegWit has actually been implemented on the main Bitcoin network, but the hard fork has not been implemented. And so now there's a great amount of controversy. Is the hard fork going to happen or is it not? Uh, so, so far, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And I, I'll just provide a little bit more context there, but all that's true. Um, so there is an initiative by DCG uh, that ended up being called the New York Agreement, which is where DCG – so DCG is a large venture capital firm in the space. They've invested in many, many Bitcoin businesses and other blockchain businesses. They're probably the biggest you know, firm that invests exclusively in blockchain businesses. Mm. Um, they basically reached out to all of their businesses, which includes <laughs> our business, yours.org. Uh, they reached out to us and basically asked if we would be willing to sign this agreement. And we thought, okay, well, this is a good idea. We'll do SegWit and a 2x hard fork. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a good compromise. Why don't we just do this? It's basically the same thing as a Hong Kong agreement, as you said. Uh, this is a way to reach you know, consensus with the community. We agree to this if other people agree to this. Like that's a perfectly valid path forward. Mm -hmm. So we signed the agreement and uh, we're on the list of, of the supporters of what's now called the New York Agreement. It's called the New York Agreement because DCG arranged this before the consensus conference in New York in May. And then in New York, there is a meeting amongst various parties that did not include us. It included more of the major uh, businesses like BitPay and, and BitGo. Mm. Um, they you know, just basically affirmed of uh, this, this sort of idea. The Bitcoin core developers were invited, people like Matt Corallo and Eric Lombroso, but they didn't go. So it ended up being uh, basically a bunch of businesses uh, that, you know, businesses, and I, I think miners were there, I'm not sure what miners, uh, but basically a large chunk of the industry decided, let's just do it this way. This mm -hmm. is going to work. Mm -hmm. So that became called SegWit 2X and or the New York Agreement. Uh, it goes by different names. And the idea is to have SegWit, you know, launched, which it now has uh, on Bitcoin, and then to have a 2x hard fork in, you know, increase in the base block size in November. And so mm -hmm. that's still moving forward. And the plan for SegWit 2x is that there's going to be another hard fork of Bitcoin in, uh, in November. And so there's tremendous uncertainty here <laughs> over exactly how this is going to play out and what's going to happen. Are we ultimately going to have three different Bitcoins? <laughs> you know, that's, it's, that's a very peculiar thing that, that no one wanted to happen, <laughs> now, but that might happen. Now with that, so the, the, one of the pieces of the puzzle that is very frustrating for me as somebody that's been in the space a while, I'm rooting for Bitcoin. I think it's totally world changing. Why wouldn't it be the case that we we could have, let's say, two chains? I get why Bitcoin Cash exists, and I get why we would have the SegWit 2x chain. Why would there be a third one? Why wouldn't it be the case that the the small blockers are on board with SegWit 2x? The, the actual difference between SegWit and SegWit 2x is tiny. So why yeah. would it? Why wouldn't that be the solution that we all celebrate and come together and say, "Hey, yay, this is it"? Why would they insist on one megabyte versus two? Yeah. Good question. So first of all, it's definitely a fact that Bitcoin Core and what I call the core followers absolutely do not want SegWit 2x. They just want SegWit. They do not want the 2x uh, in uh, hard fork. Uh, why they want that is a different question. I mean, again, I'm not the best person to ask, so I'll do the mm. best job I can to 
phrase the arguments as I see them, but anybody out there, you know, should take this, you know, you know, take this with, with my own opinion in mind, which is that I personally prefer larger uh, blocks, mm -hmm. but what they, they just do not like the way that it happened. They don't like that industry came together and agreed to this. They do not want Bitcoin to be governed that way. Um, and furthermore, you know, so that's part of it. They don't like the precedent that this sets for governing Bitcoin via consensus of a bunch of businesses. Mm. They don't like that. They also just don't like changing the protocol. They seem to not favor any change to the protocol at all. They really like soft forks instead of hard forks. And again, they're also really worried about the increasing cost of a node. Although, as, as you say, I mean, like it's such a small difference. It really makes an absolutely negligible difference in the actual cost of running a node as far as anyone that actually uses a node is concerned. A 2x increase is nothing. I mean, it mm. just doesn't matter. It, it doesn't significantly raise the cost at all. But those are their concerns. And they have declared, you know, they've already merged a change into Bitcoin Core that they're going to disconnect from SegWit2x nodes. Uh, the, it, the thing is, like, it's different with Bitcoin Cash because in the case of Bitcoin Core, they don't have any mining power. I mean, there are no miners. Well, I shouldn't say none. Uh, there is they certainly do not have anywhere near as much mining power as Bitcoin Cash or SegWit2x will have. Uh, so it's very unclear whether their fork could even survive. Uh, they, they would have to add a emergency downward adjustment just like Bitcoin Cash did in order to survive either that or change the proof of work function. So but in any case, the, the facts are they are definitely going to separate. But <laughs> there's an open question over whether that chain even could survive if they don't have any mining support. Hmm. So here's another theory. Since I'm, I don't work in the Bitcoin space, I don't have to be quite as diplomatic. But here's a, a theory for why a lot of these individuals don't support SegWit2x. And I think it might have to do with future development. Uh, who actually controls the future development of the actual Bitcoin software? Because if SegWit2x goes through, then the main GitHub repository uh, changes ownership for uh, who d can develop Bitcoin. So one way that I try to understand this phenomena of why would it be the case that <laughs> you would have this group of people not support SegWit2x is, is kind of like power. It's like developmental um, control of the network. Do you think that's fair or it's okay if you don't want to answer I me mean, and make a public answer yes. on that? No, I, I think that's fair. I mean, the way I look at it is just look at their incentives. There's a company called Blockstream that funds many core developers and there are a couple of other companies that are smaller that are very aligned philosophically with this, this point of view. They are pushing forward with a path that is in their business interests. They want to control the repository and they would they would disagree with that because it's an open source repo and it's not like it's just Blockstream employees that contribute to the repo. Right. Uh, however, it is at a sort of cultural and social level. It is definitely the exact same as the philosophy of Blockstream. Mm -hmm. So they control it not necessarily by literally employing every single core developer, but by controlling the philosophy and the communications channels around this stuff. Mm -hmm. and you know, controlling the narrative around it. And it's very important to them that they can continue to have that control. So I definitely think that's true, and I, I don't think that's a conspiracy theory or something like that. I mean, it just strikes me that it's the case. They've clearly sketched out a business plan for themselves that involves having exactly that type of control over the main Bitcoin repository. And if they lose that control, it's a disaster for their business. So it's very possible then that because of that incentive with the, those particular developers and that company, and, and the, there's also a very tight connection between those individuals and online forums. Because th that's where we've seen a lot of the censorship come from is those who, who have the, the SegWit 1X vision. So it's very possible or even very likely that come November, we're going to have the Bitcoin Cash chain. We're going to have SegWit2x, which is what the businesses and community, large parts of the actual Bitcoin community have decided on. And then a third chain, which would be something like the SegWit1x or the Bitcoin Core chain, all of which are going to be competing for being called the real Bitcoin, which one of these is the real Bitcoin. They're all going to be competing for uh, business usage. is So... Do you have any idea of what we can expect when November comes around? If it's true that we're literally going to see three, three chains trying to compete at one time. Yeah. 
Well, it's extremely difficult to say what's actually going to happen. Uh, I think that you know it, it, it does seem very likely that we'll see three change in some form or another. Uh, it's very unclear what the respective prices and mining power of that's going to be. I would say that the the Bitcoin Core version or Segwit One X almost certainly will have low mining power, and the mining power will probably be split between Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. Um, but let me add this to that. Um, you know, our business, we decided just a few days ago, we're going to go on chain Bitcoin Cash. Mm -hmm. Bitcoin Cash solves a huge problem for us. It's just so critically important that we use Bitcoin Cash because the fees are extremely low. You can actually broadcast zero fee transactions on Bitcoin Cash. Uh, I don't think zero fee will last, but because they're so pro on chain scaling, I see very low fees lasting. And for mm. our business, that's a very, very critical property that allows us to, and this is a long story about you know, the history of our business and so on, but we developed uh, payment channel technology for Bitcoin. And I won't tell the story just because it would take far too long to explain the whole story, but it ended up being the case that even with payment channel technology on Bitcoin, Bitcoin's fees got so high, we couldn't use it anymore. Mm. So we've basically shifted gears and realized that Bitcoin Cash solves the problem for us in a way that doesn't require that we use payment channels. We can just do on-chain Bitcoin Cash transactions and have even lower fees than with payment channels on Bitcoin. Mm. So from our business's point of view, Bitcoin Cash is perfect. It's exactly what we've been waiting for. So what we're going to do is, this is August, we have August, September, October, November. Between now and then, we're going to launch our product. We're going to iterate as quickly as possible. What our app is, it's a way to earn money for creating and discovering good content on the internet. We think this is the killer app for Bitcoin, and we're going to be on Bitcoin Cash instead of Bitcoin, mm -hmm. and we're going to try to drive adoption of Bitcoin Cash. If we are successful, we're going to see you know, the, the scenario here, and again, this is unstable, and I'm not trying to predict the outcome. I'm just saying sort of where we are placing our bet we're placing our bet on Bitcoin Cash being the dominant chain by November. Mm. That would be a best case scenario for <laughs> us, and I think it would be a best case scenario for basically everyone involved in Bitcoin. I think everyone would win in that scenario. I'm not saying that scenario would happen, but that's what we're pushing for. And so I think it's going to be extremely interesting to actually see how this plays out between now and November. Now, for people that are hearing about Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, it's very tempting to throw your money at crypto right now because the market's very hot. But what I've I've shared this with a few people kind of in private that it's from a financial perspective, it's either wise to one, wait out the market and see what the heck is going to play out because it's very possible that any one of these three chains will die and then all of the money invested on that chain turns to nothing. Yeah. Or two, hedge your bets. If you, if you want to get into the Bitcoin market right now and you want to buy some amount of Bitcoin, buy it on both chains because there's yeah. so many factors, so many variables at play here that it's pretty much impossible to predict what's going to happen. Yeah, I think that's good advice. And I, I agree with you. And like, I couldn't even tell anyone to buy any one of these unless they hedged and bought multiple right now. Right. The best time to buy Bitcoin was before the fork with Bitcoin Cash. People right. who own their private keys before that fork are going to own every single one of these things and they can just ride the this 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 you know this situation and and ultimately you know one of them will survive definitely we'll have at least one um, but right now is a very weird time to buy unless you are very very clued in and are placing your bets very very wisely and you know what you're getting into your money actually could go to zero right. i mean any one of these chains actually could literally go to zero and you lose everything so it's a very important risk. Well, thanks, Brian, uh, for this conversation. I appreciate that that caution. I'm going to repeat it. If people want to learn more about you and the business that you've created, where can they go? Sure. So uh, you can. I, I'm big on Twitter, so you can visit my Twitter profile, twittercom Charles. Our business is called Yours. It's available at yours.org. And uh, yeah, we're launching our beta uh, tomorrow, as of this recording. I don't know when you're going to publish it, but. Uh, people will probably be able to try it our beta uh, either uh, during or soon after they listen to this podcast and they'll have a use case for Bitcoin Cash. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ryan. Okay. Thank you very much, Steve. This was awesome. Thank you. All right. That was my conversation with Mr. Ryan Charles. I hope you guys enjoyed it. We could have kept talking for probably another three hours just on this topic. And I think I'm going to try to get him back on in November so we can have a recap of all the events, the crazy events that are sure to have taken place, and we'll get an update on where the Bitcoin network is. 
So that's all for me today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Like I said at the beginning of the show, if you want to help contribute because you appreciate work like this, please head over to patreon.com slash Steve Patterson. You could also donate Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash at the address that's in the description of this podcast. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week.